Okay, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about charitable giving and charitable legacy planning. And uh, my goal more than anything else is to give you some practical tips that might help make your charitable giving easier, more effective, and more tax-wise. So that's, that's really my goal here. So, but first, I've been working for the Catholic Foundation. It's my, been my privilege to work with them for the last 20 years. And it's, it's really an interesting dynamic because even though the Catholic Foundation has been around for 65 years, sometimes it seems like we are a really closely guarded secret. Not a lot of people seem to know what the Catholic Foundation does. So I was just gonna start from there. And, and the Catholic Foundation, what we do is we promote compassionate, charitable giving that serves donors and the needs of our community. So if you do know about the Catholic Foundation, the intersect that you probably know them the best is the community piece. And basically that takes the form of the grants that we make into the community. So last year, for example, the Catholic Foundation made grants, both our unrestricted fund and also people like you and me making gifts through their donor advised funds, the Catholic Foundation made grants of over $33 million uh, to over 660 different organizations. So that's a lot of impact and about 84, 85% of that money stayed right here in our community. So that is a great deal of impact that the Catholic Foundation has had. So what people understand less so is how we serve donors. And that's really what my role is. So I'm a senior development officer at the foundation. So what I do is help families plan their charitable giving, whether it's now or in the future. So that's, that's my job. So we're gonna start with just talking about what a planned gift is. And the, the first thing really is that it is a significant contribution. And one of the things that you'll notice is there's no dollar amount there, okay? It's not what's significant to the Catholic Foundation. It's not what's significant to St. Rita, Ursuline, you know, any of the other charities that you may be involved with. The best philanthropy that I can think of is predicated on the needs of the donor to give, not the need of the organization to receive. So the significance is what's important to you. So they can be arranged during your lifetime or even after you're gone, putting something in place. But the thing more than anything else is that really distinguishes it from writing checks is usually it's a little bit more involved to make planned gifts. Usually you might need to have at least one, if not multiple professional advisors to help you with your plan, whether it's an attorney, a CPA, a wealth advisor, and if you have charitable intent, somebody like me to help you. Usually it involves a little bit more paperwork than writing a check, and it's something where having the help of a professional is, is definitely advised. And the final thing is usually, again, you know, if you're writing a check, usually that's coming out of income. So a planned gift usually comes out of assets that you've accumulated over time. Again, whether you do it now or after you're gone. So when do people start making their plans, whether it's estate plans or planned giving? When I was first <laughs> going to work as a development officer, um, believe it or not, I went to school for this. And, uh, and the folks that I was talking to and that I was getting instruction from, they were pounding on the tax aspect of it. That you know, charitable giving is a good deal, okay? And, and that it's something where if you do this charitable planning, you're going to beat the tax man. And while that's very true, the vast majority of my experience to the tune of 99% of the people that I deal with, that's not the biggest driver. It's a great benefit but the reason why they do it is because they're passionate about an organization or they're passionate about a cause. That's what's important to them and that's what really drives the process. And I can tell you that nobody wakes up in the morning and just stretches and says, this is a great day to do my will. So I'm gonna just go out and do that. Essentially what happens is the reason why people do estate planning is it's based on your life experience. It's based on what you're going through, whether it's um, graduation of a child from high school, your first grandchild being born, uh, perhaps the death of a parent or a significant illness of a loved one, and 
you know, who knows? Maybe it's getting good information like today ends up being what spurs you to start your planning process. All those things are things that happen in your life that lead you to plan. So again, it's something where it's not happenstance. There's a reason why you begin your planning process. So, and the biggest reason, as I said, why people, why people plan their charitable giving is to fill, fulfill their charitable intentions. So that's very, very important. It allows you to designate where your gifts go. Remember Mike was talking about if you die without a will, you still have an estate plan. It's just somebody else is gonna be making the calls. So it's the same thing with charitable giving. You have the opportunity to put down in writing where you want your money to go from a charitable standpoint. You do it with your heirs, you also do it with charity. So, and it's a way to stay connected to the organizations that are important to you. And really, if it's done well, you have the opportunity to be life-giving to an organization. And what I'm referring to more than anything else is the idea of having an endowment after you're gone to support the charitable causes that are important to you that you want to continue. St. Rita was formed, what, 55, 60, or more than 60 years ago now. And the thing is, the people who were originally here at St. Rita, they didn't want you know, for St. Rita just to be there while they were alive. The important thing was, yes, that they're there for them while they're alive, but also after they're gone, for their children and their children's children. So, and the way you do that is by having an endowment set aside where the charities that are important to you or the fields of interest, that they receive a stream of income year after year after year. That is a great way to have very, very effective philanthropy. So, and it also allows you to have that very permanent connection with the charities that are important to you. Because, you know, every year when they get that check, they will remember the kindness that your family did for them. So it's very, very important. So who do you give your gifts to? So the top one is fairly straightforward. And, you know, we all know how we can write a check or something like that to give to the charities that are important to us. But there are a couple of other ways that are a little bit more advanced uh, that are also very effective. Private foundations are good, but the issue with the private foundation, pretty much, there are a couple things. Number one is nothing is less private than a private foundation. I mean, isn't that weird? You know, you, you have a private foundation. Basically, what a private foundation means is it's not private to the public. It just means that you're the only one who is, is making the decisions on it. So, you know, if you want your charitable giving to be a little bit more private, you know, working with a community foundation, especially if you have multiple charities or multiple fields of interest, can be a really, really valuable way of administering your philanthropy. And there are a number of different ways of doing that. So all of the assets that you give, I mean, I'm sure that all of the assets above are familiar to you. There is one thing that I want to focus on more than anything else, and it was something that Mike brought up, Mike Lynch, when he was giving his legal presentation. And that's the one right in the middle, and that is retirement and IRA assets. And the reason why I really want to focus on this is twofold. Number one, going forward, it is likely to be the biggest asset that a lot of people have the biggest asset that a lot of people have. Now, if you go back to the 70s when I was growing up and you know, my parents were accumulating an estate, the biggest asset my parents had was most likely their house. That's exactly right. And there's a really practical reason for that. The reason is because my father worked for a company for 40 years and the contract between my father and the company was, hey, you take care of me you know, while you're working I will take care of you in your retirement. And they had these wonderful things. I forget what they're called. Um, pensions. pensions, that's right, yes. <laughs> nobody has pensions anymore. So nobody has pensions, but you, know, you fast forward to today. Okay, so in the 70s, it was your house. So today, it's your IRA or your 401k because that burden has shifted. People don't stay with an organization anymore for 40 years. So you know, a lot of people will change every two, every three years. So, and the pensions aren't there anymore, so we are responsible for our own retirement. And that's the thing that pushes up 
uh, IRAs and 401ks. The second thing, besides the fact that it's gonna be really big, is on this entire list, all of these asset classes, it's the one that's gonna get taxed the most when you die, if you leave it to your kids. And I'm not saying it's bad to leave it to your kids, but gone are the days where you could leave it to your kids and it stretches out over the rest of their lifetimes. As Mike mentioned, nowadays, if somebody dies and the kids get the IRA, it's 10 years. So that is a maximum tax plan. So when you're talking to your financial advisors, when you're talking to your CPAs, what you give to charity, whether it's now or in the future, does matter. So be sure to ask their advice in terms of what you give to your heirs, what you leave for the charitable causes that are important to you, okay? So in terms of when to give, you know, we're gonna cover the waterfront a little bit on this. We're not gonna delve really into an individual type of giving strategy or vehicle. But in terms of now, you know, if you're just doing it by yourself without any help from a professional advisor, um, you know, giving gifts straight to charity, I think that we all know how to do that. But another way of organizing your philanthropy, we are really in an age where people more and more understand about the value of donor-advised funds. Has anybody heard of a donor-advised fund? Don't be shy. Yeah, so more people now than ever know what a donor-advised fund is. And basically what it is is instead of parceling out your gifts to individual charities, it's kind of like your own private foundation with all the red without all the red tape. So if you make a gift to your donor-advised fund, you get the tax deduction right then and there. And then over time, you recommend where you want the gifts to go. So it can be a great tax timing device, especially now you know, that the standard deduction has gone up to $24,000, right? So a lot of people, what they're doing is the strategy is they will bunch their donations so that they will basically put away two years or three years of charitable giving into their donor advised fund and they will get the tax deduction that year and in the next two or three years, that year they'll take the deduction for the charitable gift. And then in the next two or three years, they will take the standard deduction. So that has become a very, very popular strategy. In terms of the later piece of this, um, you know, making gifts from your, uh, from your will or beneficiary from an IRA is typically the way most people will do that. But again, you know, I come back to the idea of having a permanent endowment. Uh, and one of the rules of thumb especially is if you have multiple charities, permanent endowments can be a great way to help those. So we've gone through now, and the later plan is obviously through your will, but there's also a now and later option. And those are get a little bit more involved. There's a little bit more paperwork involved, and you know, we're really not gonna step through what a charitable gift annuity is or a charitable remainder trust. They're very similar vehicles. Uh, I will have an illustration at the very end that shows you how a charitable remainder trust works. So the thumbnail sketch on a charitable remainder trust is you put assets in, and over the course of your lifetime, every year, you get payments that come out of your charitable trust. And it is only after you are gone that the remainder interest goes to charity. So charitable remainder. Charity gets it after, after you are gone. So and both the charitable gift annuity and a charitable remainder trust, they work kind of like that. So the one thing I did want to mention in terms of a now and later plan, this one is really good. And as a matter of fact, this is what my wife and I have decided to do. Um, what we want to do, we already have a donor advice fund. And we use that for our regular charitable giving. And, but it, honestly, it never has very much in it. I mean, there's just not a ton in there. The big gift would come after we are gone. So what we did was we built into our donor advised fund a provision that says, upon our death, expect that there's going to be a gift coming from our estate. And at that point, the fund becomes a permanent endowment. So what we did on the legal side in terms of our will was we wrote into our wills the percentage of money that was going to go to our donor advised funds. So, you know, we bequest, pick a number, 25% to go to, you know, the Carol and Michael George donor advised fund at the Catholic Foundation. So 
The big benefit of that for me, as much as anything else, is, and I have a lot of friends who are attorneys, and, uh, and I'm not trying to cut anybody out of a fee, but you know, for the most part, one of the big reasons why people don't change their wills for their charitable intent is because they don't want to pay for it. They don't want to have to go and you know, basically get paid or pay money out to have their will changed. So for me, if I have a donor advised fund document, for me it's changing an exhibit page out of a donor advised fund document. You know, what we do is we take the old one out, we put the new one in, the donor initials it, and we go on our way. So it is a very, very efficient, very tax wise uh, thing to do. And as I said, you don't have to go back to your will if you handle your charitable giving in this manner. So, yes, sir, you have a question? You, I understand that you're an umbrella charity. Uh, do you also do administration as a separate standalone function? Do you do any uh, administration in the state and act as a trustee, for instance? The question is, do we act as a trustee for an estate or an executor of a will? The answer is no, we do not. Um, it's something where back in the early days of the foundation when you know, we were smaller, um, we could do things like that, but at this point, you know, we have some really serious restrictions, especially from a legal standpoint, that we can't do that. So, conflict of interest, that's very good, that's a big one. So, you know, really important to have those boundaries for us. So, one of the big questions that we get is, okay, how much should I leave in my will to charity? So, for the people who are charitably minded, and it's really kind of a trick question, you know, because it's, you know, very rarely do people do exactly, you know, one of these things, but I'll just step through them with you. Number one is we're all familiar, or I think we're all familiar with the idea of a biblical tithe, taking 10% of your estate and putting it to charity. And that's a terrific option. Something that is a little bit more advanced is if you're going to set up an endowment, let's say for the sake of argument that you leave $10,000 to, or that you give $10,000 to St. Rita every year. So what happens when you die? Okay, if you don't do anything and there's no charitable giving in your estate, well, St. Rita isn't getting that $10,000 that you gave them, right? They're not getting that anymore. So how do you take care of that problem if, if it is a problem for you? The way you deal with it is take that $10,000 and multiply it by 20. And just as a rule of thumb, so 20 times $10,000 is my math's right, $200,000. So a $200,000 endowment at 5% would, like clockwork, you know, would be able to support a gift to St. Rita every year, you know, in the, in the manner that you had before. So that's what the, the multiple of 20 is. So if you have, let's say you have four or five different charities that are important to you. So group them all together and, and you want to set up an endowment to support them. It's very easy to do, but if you want to get an idea of the magnitude of what corpus you would need, the amount of money in the fund, take whatever that number is and multiply it by 20, and that'll give, you, that'll give you a number. So the last thing, and this is something that's really caught on in terms of when I talk to people, this really resonates with them. And it's the idea of, you know, in a very real sense, when we're giving to charity through our wills or through our you know, 401k or IRAs, we're treating them like family. So in a very real way, they are being elevated to the level of a family member. So, you know, a natural extension of that is, okay, if you're gonna treat them like a family member, why don't we treat them like another child? So let's say, just for the sake of argument, that you have three children. And previously, you know, because we were all very fair-minded people, we had divided our estate three different ways and, and exactly the same for each. It's, uh, instead of three, you now divide it by four. And instead of getting 33% of your estate, your kids get 25% each, and charity gets a 25% share. So, and again, these aren't meant to be hard and fast. This is what you have to do. What this is, more than anything else, is give you an idea of the different ways that you can organize your philanthropy. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, I promised you that we would talk for just a moment about a charitable remainder unit trust. And we had a donor uh, back in the 90s 
who was a wonderful lady. Uh, do we have any Ursuline supporters here? Anybody? You, your money and your daughter go to Ursuline, right? So, so uh, Louise Buer was a wonderful friend of the Catholic Foundation. And she was a graduate of Ursuline, class of 1935. And she was single all her life, a St. Bernard's parishioner, but she was extremely active in terms of Catholic volunteerism. So back in the early 90s, she established a charitable remainder trust at the foundation for $777,000. So big number, right? But so she lived until 2000. And over that period of time, between the early 90s and 2000, Louise Bureau received over $360,000 from her fund. But that's not the end of the story. So the rest of the story is at death, she had a permanent endowment that was established at the Catholic Foundation where the trust was worth $4.5 million at her death. So now, your results may vary, okay? You know, nobody can promise you returns. But there was significant appreciation over that period of time. So in addition, and this is just since 2000, right? Since then, 2.56 million has gone out to support the causes that were important to Louise over that period of time. Not only that, but it keeps getting more impactful as we go along because the corpus now of that fund, and this is before this recent little run we had, uh, is $9.5 million. So I think we all can agree that that is a pretty good result. So having said that, the next steps, you know, where do we go from here? You know, the first thing to do more than anything else is to pray about it and just follow what's in your heart in terms of, you know, if you have charitable intent, well, how significant is that? What do I want to do to make sure that that is represented in my estate plans? So the first thing is pray. And then the second thing is realize that everything that we have is a gift from God. And you know, inventorying those assets and figuring out, you know, what you have where is very, very important. And then the final thing is, you know, don't put it off. Plan. So put things in paper, on paper, and make it happen. Um, and that includes your charitable planning as well. So I've always liked St. Augustine, but he said something that really resonates with me like every day, uh, and that is praise if everything depended upon God, but work as if everything depended upon you. And in this case, plan as if everything depended upon you. Because again, if you don't plan, somebody else will plan for you. So, and I think we've all worked too hard in our lifetimes to accumulate assets uh, and to take care of our families to kind of let it go to chance. So I would encourage you to plan, please. Do you all have any questions? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> That's a great question. Why the Catholic Foundation versus Communities Foundation or, or some other community foundation? And the short answer is, um, you know, because the Catholic Foundation is, is actually a community foundation just like communities. We have all the various tools that communities has uh, available to us. And it's, you know, it's, there's a focus on our Catholic faith. You know, money that the Catholic Foundation gets um, you know, and any fees that we make is recycled back into our community because of the grants that we make. So if you want to be focused about your philanthropy and you like the idea of money going back into our Catholic community, the Catholic Foundation is a great place to be. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Tom? Did you have a donor advised fund? fund and you don't specify anything after your death, what happens to the funds in that? Usually what happens with that is it goes to the unrestricted philanthropy fund of the foundation. So, and you're still a part of the foundation because for every grant that we make after that, you are a part of that because of the unrestricted grants we make out of that fund. Last year it was about $1.4 million that came out of that fund. Good question. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Well, we, um, the, the question is, do you, um, do you take intangible gifts? Can you give me an idea of where you're heading? Let's say a chosen action. Say, say somebody had a, you know, a, a suit for lots of big damages, 
It hasn't been collected. It hasn't been adjudged yet. But it is a, an asset and it is intangible. Uh, copyrights, things that, that have income that may be subject to. Uh, OK, a little bit more color on intangibles, uh, things like a lawsuit that's going to trial. Uh, you know, things, things like that. You know, the short answer is probably not. You know, the, the, the bottom line is uh, those kinds of things are very, very difficult, uh, you know, to turn around. You know, we'll talk with a donor. We'll talk with their professional advisors. Uh, we have a pretty firm gift acceptance policy. Usually those types of assets <coughs> won't make the cut. So, you know, most of the things that we deal with are the things that you would expect. You know, cash stocks, um, IRAs, insurance gifts, you know, that's pretty much a wheelhouse. When you start to get into things like homes, artwork, collections, all of those types of things, it's a lot more paperwork and a, a lot more hassle. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't take them, but they require a lot more due diligence. Good question. <coughs> Other questions? Anybody from this side of the room? Yes, ma'am. Do we give to charities that are national or international? The, qu the answer is yes. Donors through their donor advised funds and permanent endowments. Um, my wife went to Baylor, Sikkim Bears, right? Um, and every year we give a gift from our donor advised fund to Baylor University, which last time I checked is neither local nor Catholic. <laughs> so it's the, the, the restriction that we have, the material restriction that we have is that as long as it's not in conflict with Catholic teaching, we're in good shape. So it has to be a 501c3. We can't give to individuals. Uh, but as long as it's, it's, you know, that type of a gift, you know, we, uh, you know, we're just fine. Does that answer your question? Uh, international, let me just touch on that for a second. We have helped donors to make gifts uh, internationally. We had a donor who wanted to help build a chapel in Kampala. And we used a Friends Of organization, which means basically a United States-based charity to ensure that that gift was being used for that particular purpose. So ultimately, the grant did go overseas, you know, but we used an organization inside the United States first to make that happen. Thank you. Any other questions? Y yes. Okay, the question is twofold. You know, number one is how much does the Catholic Foundation take off the top? And then the second piece of that is, um, is, it, is it, you know, judgment proof? Is it something where there's, it's not subject to judgments, settlements, or fees? I'm going to answer the second one first. The Catholic Foundation is not a part of the Diocese of Dallas. We are independent of the diocese. You know, having said that, you know, we do work with them you know, closely, but, you know, we, you know, being part, you know, party to any of the lawsuits with them because we're not associated with them directly, um, you know, that's kind of hard to do. So um, the, the first part of your question was fees. How much do we take off the top? Well, it's uh, the biggest fee that the Catholic Foundation has is 1%. So, you know, if you want to look at it from the obverse, 99% of the funds that come into the Catholic Foundation go to the causes that are important to you. Not only that, but they have the opportunity to appreciate over time. So 1% fee, you know, we feel is, is very reasonable for the service that we offer. Okay? Any other questions that we have? For the 1%, do you do all administration, tax returns, manage the funds? Well, because we're a nonprofit, we, okay, the question was, we, it's all the administration of a fund. Typically, yes. Uh, on the tax returns, he also asked if uh, it covers the tax return. We're a nonprofit. We don't file. I mean, we don't file a. You know, we have a global umbrella. You know, okay, tax so return. Once it goes into you, then there is no separate individual return. There is. Correct. No, you get your tax deduction up front, and at that point, it's it's the foundation's asset. I think we've got time for one more question, Patricia. Where, where are the funds invested? 
Well, we have, uh, we have three layers of management in terms of the funds that, that the Catholic Foundation has. Number one is we have a group out of Atlanta called LCG, and they are, they are retained by the Catholic Foundation, and they provide for fee advice in terms of you know, what we should invest in. So once we get that, then we move on to we have a board of trustees, and on that board we've got a number of people who are wonderful investment professionals. So they take the advice that we get from LCG and they vet that and they take, sure, take a look and make sure that that's appropriate and then they ratify an investment policy you know, for us. Uh, and there are a number of different you know, big firms in terms of individual mutual funds and stock issues uh, you know, that we have, um, you know, but the, it, the way it's managed is through our board and the way it's implemented, our CFO has her Series 65 license, you know, which means that she's where the rubber meets the road. She's the one that executes you know, the trades and makes sure that the money goes to where it's needed in terms of investments. Okay? I think we got time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Margie? I volunteer at Network of Community Ministries in Richardson. Mm -hmm. Oh, Margie, thank you. Very much appreciated. We might have time for one more question. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, Margie said that the organization that she works for, or that she works with and volunteers with, that there was money that was needed for a truck. You know, that, I'm sorry, refrigerated truck. To pick up food. To pick up food. Thank you, Margie. And, uh, and the Catholic Foundation helped them get that vehicle. So a very tangible way that we interface with the community. So thank you. One more question? Are we all good? Awesome. Thank you.